My name is Griffin Cannell, and I'm a digital marketing specialist for Megger. I'll be acting as the moderator for today's presentation and supporting you in any technical issues or questions for our presenter team. On the left side of your screen, you will see the Ask a Question window. You could submit questions at any time during the presentation, and I will read the questions out during the Q&A segment at the end of the webinar. Additionally, your certificate of attendance, copy of the presentation, and a link to the recording of this webinar will be sent to all attendees in two business days. Our presenter today is Nadozi Iranini, Applications Engineer. To, res oh, sorry, to assist with the question and answer session, we also have joining us Bonnie Naranjo, Principal Engineer, and Joseph Aguirre, Senior Applications Engineer. With that, I will hand things over to our presenter. Thank you for joining us today, Dozy. All right, thank you, Griffin. Yes. Okay, without further ado, uh, let's go ahead and get started. I don't see the presentation on my screen. Okay. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, my name is Nadozi Aranini, and today I'll be uh, running you guys through the presentation on how to interpret the test result on a high voltage circuit breaker. Uh, so the agenda for this meeting, uh, just because everyone here would have different backgrounds, some might be very well familiar with circuit breakers, some might not be. We're gonna start off with a basic understanding of a circuit breaker, the functionality and how a circuit breaker works. Uh, that would then lead into the segue of the test theory and the result interpretation. And then we're gonna wrap up with uh, looking at some instrument catalog that Mega has that aids in testing the theory and results uh, for circuit breaker understanding and testing. Uh, so just uh, sit tight, hang on and enjoy the ride. So uh, going into circuit breakers, we have many types. Um, we have in the high voltage side, we have a lifetime circuit breaker. Um, get a pointer here. Uh, we have a lifetime circuit breaker. We have a dead tank circuit breaker. We have a GIS and we have a vacuum. Uh, when I say high voltage, just for the sake of this presentation, I'm saying everything above one kV uh, because I'll use I'll just use the term circuit breakers a lot. And on the low voltage side, we have basically below 1,000 volts. These are uh, uh, modded case circuit breaker. Uh, this is racking into smaller cubicles. And for testing these, typically you're looking at a time current curve characteristics and you're testing your long time, short time, your instantaneous and ground function. Uh, this presentation would not cover uh, testing functions of low voltage circuit breakers. We're gonna be primarily focused on uh, high voltage circuit breakers. Uh, so going into high voltage circuit breakers, to best understand it, uh, we'll be looking here at the anatomy of a high voltage circuit breaker components. Uh, I typically like to break this into three parts, uh, just to kind of get an understanding. And the first side, we have the uh, interrupting unit, which is right here. Uh, that's typically where you have your main and arcing contact, uh, where you also, it also houses your uh, grading capacitor and also your pre uh resistors if the uh, breakers have those. And the main contact is actually what opens up to disconnect uh, the breaker. Uh, the breaker is essentially a switch. Uh, and so in order for that switch to work, which is the breaker, you have the operating mechanism. There you have the energy storage, your latch and tripping mechanism. This is basically the mechanical action. In this case of the circuit switch in the picture, that would be the rod right here that drives the uh, that drives the interrupter to open. So it's a mechanical component and it's very important. And lastly, you have your auxiliary system. That's where you have uh, your close coil, your trip coil, your DC battery coming into that uh, control circuit. And you also have your motors, you have uh, your interlocking contacts. So everything has to work in tandem for the breaker to operate. Your auxiliary system, uh, it was basically the brain and has those contacts. They tell your operating mechanism to move, which then, uh, in, which then drives your arcing contact and that opens or closes. And that is the idea of the anatomy of a high voltage circuit breaker. Uh, so moving on to the next. Um, here we can see more details. Here's an SF6 example for, uh, for a live tag circuit breaker. Um, sorry, I have a kid in the house who's disturbing me, but uh, here you go. Uh, so here you have the incoming conductor in this case. Uh, your current comes in. Uh, this is the actual switch and the interrupting mechanism, and this is your outgoing conductor. And here you have the the uh, uh, the interrupting mechanism here has two parts, which is your main contact and your arcing contact. That's also the chamber where the uh, 
SF6 gas is located, uh, then you have the support isolator, basically a standoff insulator to support the system. And that also has the link system uh, to drive those main contacts open. And then as discussed, you have your operating mechanism, your trip call, your close calls, and your auxiliary contacts to ensure the breaker opens. Uh, now, the breaker itself, it's a switch. It needs some type of uh, control to tell it when to open or close. And then you have the control logic of the breaker. And I've simplified this here. Uh, typically, you have a control circuit that is DC powered. Uh, that's indicated by the plus or minus. Uh, and you have two main coils. You have your close coil, as the name says, you may, this, makes, this is what gives the uh, command for the breaker to close. And you have the trip coil, which is what gets energized and basically performs the action for the breaker to uh, uh, trip. And within that circuit, you have a bunch of permissives that must be satisfied in order for the breaker to open or close. So just a quick one, uh, circuit breaker control logic 101. In order for the uh, close call to operate, a signal, um, take a pen here. Uh, the name of the game is once, uh, once signal flows through here, this call energizes and the breaker closes. And likewise for the uh, uh, trip side, uh, for the open side, the signal flows through here, the permissive has to be satisfied. Every permissive has to be satisfied and then the breaker uh, uh, trips. And the two main contacts uh, that we look at here in order for this to happen are my A and B contact, uh, also known as 52A, uh, 52 being the ANSI number for circuit breaker and uh, 52 uh, uh, B. Uh, a follows uh, the state of the breaker, which is normally open. If the breaker is open, A is open. And if the breaker is closed, A is closed, and B does the opposite. So now we've understood the control logic of a circuit breaker. This is what it would look like in the field. Uh, if you actually have the drawings of your breaker. And here, the bunch of permissives to basically understand this. Here we find our, our close call is right here. Our trip call is right here. And these are all permissives that need to be satisfied in order for the breaker to uh, operate. These are all permissives. These are all permissives. And these are all permissives um, to be satisfied to make sure the trip call and the close call actually operates. So in this case, we see here, uh, I get a pointer. Here, this is my 52B contact, 52-1B. And on this side, this is my 52-1A contact. So typically when we want to test the breaker, uh, uh, we're basically connecting to this, uh, ox this uh, control circuit. One and two is typically your uh, power supply, which is your plus and minus, and this will be terminal block one and two. That's where you connect your DC in. And seven and nine uh, is the standard for your close point connection. And you see we're connecting uh, above the permissive and nine would be your trip uh, point connection. So hence the uh, very famous seven, seven for close, nine for open, one and two positive negative. Uh, but it can vary depending on the breaker, so always consult your, uh, um, your diagram and your logic. So now, we've now understood the breaker, we've understood the anatomy, we've understood how it works. Now let's look at the duties of a circuit breaker. A uh, circuit breaker is very unique. We would want it to conduct. Uh, being a good conductor, we also want it to be able to break. Um, break in this case would be current, break the current flowing through it, and we also want it to isolate once that current is broken. Unlike, more, uh, unlike most electrical equipment, circuit breakers is performing three different functions. Uh, in the case of uh, uh, a bus, a bus bar connection, all you want that to do is conduct. So when you do a contact resistance on that, you're hoping you have a good path for a bus. In the case of a transformer, all it's doing is uh, stepping down voltage or uh, a stepping up voltage, but a breaker not only has to conduct, it also has to be able to break. So you need, uh, so for conduct, you need to have a good conductor. For breaking, you need fast reaction, quick acceleration of, of mass, and you want it to be able to extinguish the act when it's breaking and also damp out the me mechanical energy, excess mechanical energy after a break. And then isolate. Once your breaker is open, you really, you want minimal or no leakage at all. So you want it to be a perfect insulator. Uh, so given these three duties of a circuit breaker, when we test, we're essentially verifying the duties. Uh, we're verifying these duties directly. Directly would be if we're testing the conducting stage, we want to make sure it's a good conductor. Uh, we're verifying that directly. Indirectly would be 
uh, in the case of testing the auxiliary circuits, uh, like we just saw behind, to see how quickly uh, the uh, the core current the core receives current for the breaker to break. That would be an indirect uh, uh, test. Uh, so now we're going to look at the test methods for each three different duties for the circuit breaker, and from there we'll interpret the results. For the conduct uh, for the conducting phase. Uh, typically, because as a conductor, you will want to do a static resistance measurement. Uh, this is also known as SRM, doctor, or DLRO, uh, digital low re resistance reading. Uh, for the break, we want to do a contact timing, a contact travel dynamic resistance measurement, core current analysis. And for the isolate, we're doing an insulation resistance and a power factor test. So now moving into uh, contact resistance, on the conducting side, um, we want to do contact resistance primarily because too high of a resistance will lead to a power loss, uh, and this is called your I square R, and this can lead to the heating of the circuit breaker. Uh, when we do contact resistance, we're verifying against the specification. It's typically 20 to 50 micro ohms. Uh, that's what the result is for high, usually for high voltage circuit breakers. So if it's higher than 50 micro ohms say 100 micro ohms, you should be raising your eyebrows, why? Uh, you also, this is also a resistance test, so it means nothing that as a spot look, you trend to see results to see your deviations. Now for special breakers like generator breakers, uh, these are usually less than one micro ohms. Uh, the test method, of course, because you're testing contact as a conduct phase, we want to test the break in closed state. And how this is done is you're injecting the DC current uh, as you can see in this diagram here, um, we're injecting a DC current, I, and we're also measuring the voltage drop across where we're injecting the current. So current would flow, uh, let me draw right here, current would flow from here through the breaker contacts and out and back to the test instrument. So it's basically circulating and then we're measuring the voltage V1 v2 so what was essentially we're doing we're doing ohm's law v divided by i would give me the resistance uh for test current for i triple e it's 100 amps this is dc and for iec is 50 amps uh, and you should never exceed the rated current of the breaker uh in this case this test can be done while the breaker uh with a dual ground while the breaker is grounded on both sides and this instrument right here showing that is our dlr hole uh, 100 HB, um, and in order to do this, you would need a specialized, uh, this instrument in the case has a specialized uh, 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 clamp, a CT clamp, a DC clamp, to guard against the current going to ground. Um, so why use a high test current? You might argue, well, when I do my uh, bus bar connection, this is good copper at any voltage. I'm using 10 amps, using a DLR or 10, uh, uh, 10 amp. Uh, DC connection. So why high test current? For circuit breakers, this helps a lot with noise ratio. The higher current you have, which means you're going to have a higher voltage because I times R equals V, and this helps with the signal to noise ratio and also minimizes induced current. You also decrease the influence of thermal, uh, thermal EMF, which is also known as your Seebeck voltage. And when you use a high test current, suppose your breaker contacts have some contamination, some grease, the current can burn through that and uh, to give you a proper reading of your resistance. And lastly, if you have a hot spot, like you, as you can see in the picture below, once you have a hot spot, you basically have uh, a surface area where you have good connections and there's a lot of current flowing through that area. So those are hot. With a high current, you would have a high resistance value. Uh, but when you use low test current, uh, your results could be bad, but you don't know that, or it could be good and you don't know that because bad result doesn't necessarily mean the con the contact is in bad condition because if I use a low test current, for example, and the contact is contaminated, uh, the, cur the current might not burn through that grease. So I can read that as a, a high resistance and say, oh, my, my breaker contacts are not good. Well, that's not the case. That's because you didn't use high enough current. And vice versa, when you use a low current and you have hot spots, you're not going to see that uh, because you're not going to heat up that spot effectively enough. And you might read a low resistance reading and think your test is in good situation, whereas it's not. So that's why that's the case for using a high test current. So next, uh, uh, that's it for the conduct stage. So now in the breaking stage, we do a contact timing. Typically, what we're doing here, uh, basically, 
We're connecting our leads on the breaker on the incoming and outgoing side, and we're calculating how quickly it opens, typically like a stopwatch, and we're recording that time. Uh, it's basically, when we're referencing this value with what we have in the circuit breaker manual, uh, we're looking at the synchronization between face to face, say for example, a and C phase opens at, uh, or A and B phase opens at 20 milliseconds, but C phase is opening at uh, 23 or 24 milliseconds. You know there's a disagreement there. Uh, and typically, these are your standard uh, uh, for contact measurements for the IEC, a quarter cycle, one of a six cycle. And but typically, how you verify your results is verifying it against your circuit breaker manual or the uh, or the nameplates. Uh, you can also have uh, correct timing between your main and pre-insertion pre resistors if the breaker has it. And you can also check the auxiliary contact lead and lag time. Your auxiliary contact in this state is the A and B contact I showed that was in the control drawing. Uh, so the, here's your contact time in sequence. You typically start with a close operation, an open operation, a close open, which is also known as a trip free. Uh, if your breaker is used for a reclose operation, you can also do an open delay close and an open delay close open. Uh, so when you connect in this in the figure here, you see a, an instrument connected to, in this case, this is two break per phase. Uh, once you connect, how the instrument knows that the breaker is open or closed, it does that by doing a resistance measurement and it compares that to a threshold. If the breaker is open, it's gonna see a high resistance. And when it compares that to a threshold, it knows, okay, the breaker state is open. And if it's closed, it's gonna see a low resistance and it's gonna know that it's closed. So once you send the signal uh, to open the breaker, once it sees that resistance change, it calculates the change from the beginning to the end, and then it gives you the time. Uh, contact resistance measurement can also be done with dual ground. Uh, using our uh, using our DCM with our TM1800 and TM1700 module. And uh, this is how this could be achieved. So typically when you, um, I'm gonna get a pen here. When you're going to test your breaker, you isolate and you ground. You ground and you isolate, right? And then you make your connection and then you lift one ground and you test. Well, a challenge comes because of safety issues. Most people don't wanna go back up and lift the ground. You wanna do it with dual grounds. Uh, the problem with that is since we're doing a resistance measurement, if we have dual grounds, once we inject, once that pulse is injected and we want to time how quickly this contact opens, we're going to have a flow to ground and also a flow to ground. So we cannot really tell because you have circulating current around ground. We cannot really tell when that contact has really opened. Uh, so to combat this, we came up with a system uh, basically where we treat the breaker as a capacitor. Uh, if you think of a capacitor, it's basically two parallel plates, uh, uh, two parallel conductors separated by an insulation. In this case, this would be a conductor. Uh, this would be a conduct, uh, let me get my pen here. This would be a conductor, and this is another conductor, and this is the insulation. So when the, so this is basically this. So we can treat this as a capacitor and then use an AC current and vary the frequency to get a tune point. So essentially, this signal generator and this capacitor would have a, tube, a tune point where they have a resonating frequency. And then based on the amplitude of that current, when it changes state, we know whether the breaker is open or closed. So this is how dual ground measurement can be done to achieve timing. Um, so now let's look at how we interpret the timing results for a circuit breaker. Most people just time it and look at the numbers and the graphs look uh, very, uh, very, very confusing. A second here, I have a little boy. Here you go, sit down here. Yeah. And the graph looks very, very confusing, but it's very easy. Uh, the thin line basically represents open and the thick line represents closed. So in this case, we're looking at a closing timing results. Uh, so here I have my A phase. This is my A phase, my B phase, and my C phase. So I can see it was closed. I'm gonna use B phase for reference. It was closed until it basically opened when it became thick. At that point, it opened. And over here, we have my auxiliary contacts. I'm gonna call A prime and my other auxiliary contact, which is the B prime. Okay, sorry about that. Take go sit down, I'm busy. Um, so 
you can see here, the thin line represents your open. So first the auxiliary contact is thin and then it turns tick. So basically the, the, the uh, signal has been sent to the auxiliary contact. It then opens and you see there's a small delay from when the auxiliary contact opens to when the main contact opens. And this is how you look at your timing results. And typically uh, this would be the case for an open result. You'd have a thick line representing open and a thin line represent a uh, thick line representing close, my bad, and a thin line representing open. And when you look at this result, you're gonna have times. You're gonna have opening time for A phase, opening time for B phase, and opening time for C phase. So the question arises: which of them is the time the breaker actually opens it? You always want to go with the slowest time. Uh, so if, for example, if A phase opens at 17.3 milliseconds, B phase opens at 17. Point two milliseconds and C phase opens at 17.5. The time the breaker opened is 17.5 because in terms of coordinating with upstream electrical devices, that is actually when the last contact opened. Uh, and then this is your close open timing results. As you can see, it's a thick, it's a thick and uh, uh, a thin line and a thick line and then back to a thin line representing the close open timing, okay? So next, after uh, timing, we're gonna look into motion and travel measurement. A lot of people don't do motion or travel primarily because they think it's a hassle or they feel it's a hassle to uh, install a transducer and they really don't know why they're testing. Uh, recording the travel during a brake operation is really good. Uh, in addition to doing your close and open timing, if it's too slow, you can tell that the breaker has a problem to extinguish the arc uh, because uh, it's a motion, and if it's too fast, you can also have possibly mechanical damage. Uh, it can also give you insight to your contact stroke if you have enough contact gap. Uh, you can look at your contact penetration to see if you have good contacts, and you can look at the damping dynamics to see whether you're at risk of mechanical damage and over travel or whether you have excessive damping. So to kind of give an ex idea, when we measure motion, Motion is essentially speed, it's a velocity, it's a distance divided by time. And uh, here I have a picture of different motions for different types of body. So in a stationary body, you're not moving, time is just flying, but there's no distance. So your, uh, uh, your acceleration is essentially zero, your speed is zero, it's stationary. For a, uniform board, uh, for a uniform body, take for example a car driving at 50 miles an hour, your distance is 50, and your time is in an hour. So you're going in a constant uh, constant speed uniformly. Uh, your acceleration is constant. For a non-uniform motion, for a non-uniform motion, uh, this is just not, uh, you're basically changing acceleration. When it increases, you have a curve that looks like this. And when it decreases, you have a curve that looks like this. If you think of a circuit breaker, uh, once the stroke is actually moved with all the, uh, 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 the, uh, if we remember when I looked at the anatomy of the circuit breaker, your operating links that drives your interrupting contact, all those is not a linear motion because you have a spring, you have damps, you have links, you have elbows. So it's going to take the form of a non-uniform motion. And this is how we're going to be able to describe the mechanical damping activities of the circuit breaker and get more insight to how well a circuit breaker is breaking. Uh, because now we're talking about the brake state of a circuit breaker. So to uh, do your motion travel measurement, uh, typically you need a transducer, and a transducer is a device that uh, that turns uh, uh, analog signal to a voltage reference. So in this case, we have a rotary transducer. When this breaker is opened or closed, it would spin this transducer, located in the picture right here, the spin this transducer, and that rotational movement would cause a voltage signal in which the signal would, with which the unit would read and interpret that uh, rotation to a length, uh, basically rotational motion to a linear motion to determine the speed. Uh, in this case, you have a linear transducer. This is just lin linear. For those that know this, you have a, basically a slider. This would slide again. The sliding moment is translated into a voltage signal uh, that is uh, uh, read by the instrument, and then you use that to basically uh, time your travel. Uh, so now let's look at how to understand the travel graph. Uh, when you look at this at first sight, it could look complicated, but if you think of it, of, uh, of the motions we just talked about as a non-uniform motion, you get to see that there's a non-uniformity here for an increase and a non-uniformity here for a decrease. And it's just two parts to it. So you have your, uh, you have your, 
open and then you have sorry you have your close so the bottom here is your close fully closed fully open position my bad and the top here is your fully closed position and the break is basically here what we're seeing this is your thin lines which represent open and your thick lines which represents close so to get a good understanding of this picture uh what we're doing here the breaker was first is is, is open and we're telling it to close so we start from here and from this point to this point is my full stroke basically going from open to close and then as the breaker starts to travel once the signal is sent in right here this is your contact touch that's when the breaker begins to close and this is the uh, upper contact touch. Uh, basically, from here, this two times right here is time before the upper point. And after that, the breaker comes and is an over travel. The over travel, because this is not, the breaker is not perfect. You have springs, you have damping. You're going to have an over travel or rebound until it smoothens out. And then you're in a closed position. And vice versa, when you're doing your uh, open position, you're traveling from here. And then this is your contact touch. You're measuring that time, which is your reference for the speed. It goes all the way down. And then, likewise, when it opens, uh, when it's closing, rather, you also have your under travel and your rebound. And to really understand this, when we do this measurement, what we're really checking here, we're looking, of course, we're looking at our contact touch to calculate the speed, as well as we're looking at our damping time. So if you look right here, um, I've got a pen here. If you look right here, oh, it's my pen. There we go. If you look right here, we see from here to here tells us how the breaker traveled to the fully till he got to the full open state. If this is more steep, we know that the break, the damping time is shorter, which means the breaker is slamming open, and we don't want that. Uh, if it's yeah, and if it's uh, if it's less steep, we know we have good damping. Uh, so that can give us insight to how well the breaker is actually opening. Uh, so let's look at a real life graph for now. This is a closing graph. As you can see, looking at the previous graph, what I've done here is the previous uh, timing we had for our timing results for A, B, and C, I've supernated the motion graph along with that. So for a closing, it's the same characteristics. We can see the uh, we can see the travel measurement on that, and the two dots right here. Uh, so this is the travel measurement. This is the motion graph, and this is the over travel, damps out, and then the breaker is now fully closed. And we can see over here we have two points that where we used to reference to measure the actual travel. And this is what the graph would look like for closing. And you can guess what the graph would look like for opening. It's just the opposite. Uh, so. You see the graph going down, and then it under travels, rebounds, and then flattens out. And I can measure my damping time from this point and this point to see how quickly it travels down. And that is basically the motion curve. Uh, so now let's look for a scenario why the motion is really important. So let's look into a case study. This is a breaker where timing measurement was done. As you can see, thin line is, uh, is open. Our uh, uh, thick line is closed. So this was an open timing measurement. Uh, and it all passed. A phase is measuring 19.3. B phase is measuring 19 milliseconds. And C phase is basically measuring 18.3. Uh, so all within the specification, and they all pass. Uh, but there was no motion. And then the motion was then done. And as you can see in this picture, uh, uh, B phase being the yellow curve for the motion, let me use yellow just to make it, yeah, B phase being the yellow curve, you see it damps faster than uh, A and C, which is the blue and red. So just by doing that, although the timing are good, we can see that there's a large over travel and velocity on B phase, and there's an opening speed difference. Uh, the timing is the same but this is the speed. So the contacts are opening right at, at the same time, but the speed characteristics is different. So the dab shot was re replaced on the B phase for this breaker, and the result was done and redid after the dab shot was replaced, and now the result looked better. As you can see here, the open speed is 7.92, and for A phase and for B phase is 6.29, within range, and from now the green, red, and yellow graph you see, they have similar damping characteristics. This is why motion is really, really important. If this wasn't, if this wasn't done, 
If the dap shot wasn't replaced, even though the timing measurement was done, the breaker would have failed in service uh, over time when called to perform on. And this is why we basically analyze motion on breakers and why it's important. So next, let's go to dynamic resistance measurement. This name sometimes could be misleading, uh, but it's a very, very good measurement for SF6 breakers uh, to measure the arcing contact length. Uh, so essentially, We've done a static resistance measurement when the breaker is con in the conducting phase and, and closed. So now when we're transitioning in the break phase, sometimes we want to see how that resistance behave, especially the arcing contact, because you know you might have fingers that are scratched off from frequent operations that you might not see when you're in the closed state. Uh, so we do this test to basically measure the arcing contact length of an SF6 breaker. Uh, and how it's done is very similar to the static resistance measurement. You basically inject a current. In this case, this is the breaker right here. Uh, this is my interrupting unit is inside here. So this is where the breaker opens, it's in here. Uh, so what I do is I inject a DC current and then I measure the voltage drop. And simultaneously, I'm doing that while I'm opening or closing the breaker. Uh, so basically, it's a, it's a resistance measurement over time. Uh, and this can give us insights. Uh, uh, and you can also do this with both sides grounded uh, with our DLR100 and our TM units. Uh, so let's look at the analysis of a dynamic resistance measurement. So now we're masters at analyzing timing measurement and motion measurement. At first sight, it always looks complicated, but it really isn't if you understand what's going on. So the blue curve here represents the resistance, the dynamic resistance, so it changes. So at first, uh, at first, and the, the white curve here is the motion. So this is the motion curve we're just looking at, talking about, that's the white overlay curve right there. So looking at that motion is a decreasing motion, so I know this is an open, this is an open state. So at first, right here, uh, where I have this blue highlight in the bottom of the screen, that is a static measurement. So we inject current, the breaker is, uh, the breaker is already closed, the resistance is constant, because uh, that's, uh, that's the static resistance. And then, as the breaker starts to open, the resistance starts to jump up a little bit, uh, small increase in resistance because the main contact is sliding, and then the breaker opens the main contact uh, 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 the arcing con the sorry, the main contact opens, and then you have an increase in resistance. But likewise, you then have your arcing contact that has not fully opened. It's now paralleled with that, which then drops your resistance down. And then once the arcing contact fully opens, your resistance goes up because now you have infinite. So very uh, three important points to uh, uh, recognize in this graph. First is basically your uh, static phase. Your, uh, your breaker is sitting still, that's your static resistance measurement. Your main contact then opens, your resistance spikes up, but your arcing contact is not fully opened, so that brings it down, and then the arcing contact opens. And so looking at this graph, when you overlay it, uh, now let's look at the red is the current trace. I'm gonna use a, a yellow here. So the current, because you're injecting DC current, it's closed, it's conducting well, it's closed, and then the breaker starts to open, the current then goes because it slows, it decays down to zero because once it's fully opened, you don't have any current flowing. So that's why the current goes from a, a closed state flowing 100 amps and then drops down to zero. And on the motion curve, uh, basically, if we overlay the motion curve and we take the point where my main contact opens, uh, my arc, uh, let me get a red this thing right here. Well, I look at the point where my main contact opens, which is right here, and I look at the point where my arcing contact now opens before the breaker, the resistance goes to uh, infin infinite. Uh, this, this tells me the difference between my main contact and my arcing contact. But if I overlay that on my motion curve, remember motion is distance over time, x-axis is time, so this is distance. The length from here to here gives me the length of my arcing contact. So anytime I do this test, once this length is getting uh, uh, smaller and smaller, I know my arcing contact is burning off. And this is the importance of dynamic resistance measurement. So the next would be uh, a core current analysis. 
Uh, typically, this is that auxiliary part I was talking about where this is the background. Here we're looking at my close coil and my trip coil, and we want to understand how this function, because this can give us insight not only to our, our DC state, but it can also give us insight as well to the health of the trip coil. Uh, so here, again, the graph, when you do your test, you see all those graphs come up, but they look very, uh, I guess, frightening. But once you understand the theory behind it, it becomes easier. A coil is nothing but an inductor. It's just a coil. It's just an inductor. And we know inductors, usually my breaker uh, control voltage is at DC. Uh, inductor, once it sees a DC voltage, is first going to oppose that current. But over time, in steady states, it basically wants to act as a short. Uh, so looking at this graph right here, uh, the graph is current plotted against time. So immediately, and we're going to say, let's use this as the closed coil, for example. So uh, current goes, the closed coil uh, contacts close. Current begins to flow through the coil. As current begins to flow through the coil, current is going up. It encounters a resistance because the resistance encounters because the amateur starts to travel at this point right here. And as the amateur travels, it changes the electromagnetic a property of that coil and creates an opposing voltage to oppose the DC voltage supplied on the system. And once that does that, the current begins to drop. And then the current drops until the amateur operates the trip latch. And then it completes its full travel. It drops down all the way and that resistance has been defeated. Now the current can keep rising again because now this is just, uh, and this point where it rises, basically you've defeated the, uh, uh, inductive property of the coil, you're now in the purely resistive state. So at some point, the coil has a DC resistance, which is V over I, V being your, the voltage you're applying on the coil, and I being the current being flowing through. So this uh, portion right here from 78 is proportional to your DC core resistance. And then the coil is now energized, the coil has been energized operated the trip latch at 0.5, it's now reached its full saturation state where you have the DC resistance and now your, uh, your uh, contacts are now opening up so you don't bond the coil and then it discharges back to zero. So just looking at this, this can give us so many insights. If I look at this graph, uh, what happens if my amateur travel there's a mechanical friction in my amateur travel. So something is wrong with my coil, there's a, there's a mechanical friction. Because of that, I'm gonna need more current. So my graph is gonna trace something like this. Uh, let me get a pen here. Because I need more current, so my graph is gonna trace something like this, is steeper. And because there's more mechanical resistance, this is gonna drop lower. It's gonna drop lower and then it's gonna then come up. So you can just see, based on looking at the curve signature, you can already get insight to how the health of your trip call. Well, trip call burn up a lot. And oftentimes, because remember, this area right here in this curve is my, uh, is this area in this curve, let me highlight that. The area in this curve right here, oh, was right here, that's my, uh, my resistance, my core resistance at full saturation. If the resistance of my coil is now high, uh, the reasons my call is now high, I expect to have a higher current. So if I have a higher current in the future, if I have a high coil resistance, you can guess this line will be higher right here. So that tells you your call is already getting high resistance when you compare it to the previous results. And likewise, uh, the change of resistance will also change the ramp rate because this is just the IR ramp rate over here. So this can give you insights to how well your trip, your call is operating. And if, well, what if, let me give another scenario. What if the resistance of the coil hasn't changed? This can also give you as to the health of your battery, your battery banks, because if this resistance is now lower, if the current is right here, everything was the same. Let me draw on this graph. But the current is right here instead. That tells me, huh, everything is the same. My resistance hasn't changed, but now the current is lower. That tells me my DC voltage, the battery on those voltage is getting weaker to supply the needed, uh, I probably need charging to supply the needed tripping characteristics of the coil. So that's why you do maintenance all in hand. You can check your battery, your battery monitoring is very important because that can also affect the, uh, 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 the tripping time or closing time of a circuit breaker. 
So that is that that is that is it for core current analysis. So next, let's look at the motors. Uh, this is this is part of the auxiliary systems and the breaker. You have a spring charge motor. It's also important uh, to monitor the health of this motor because this basically does the work to charge the spring. And when we look at a motor, a motor typical graph. Once the motor gets energized, being an inductive motor, you're always going to have a peak current due to your inrush. Typically, this is six times or eight times your full load amps. And then that current decays and gets the steady state current. So that's a typical curve for a, a spring charge motor. So now let's look at what the results would look like. And to do this test, you need a CT, a clamp on CT to put across the cable so you can see the health of that motor. Uh, as you can tell, if your motor has a higher, uh, has winding issues, your steady state current will be higher. Uh, if your spring has changed characteristics, the motor will need more amps to basically uh, 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 push those uh, push those springs. So in this case, in the curve here, we have uh, my inrush, which is right here. Uh, then it wants to settle, but the motor has to charge a spring. So the amps is pushing through, mm, winding through that spring. Uh, it's basically, as the spring compresses, the resistance become higher, so the motor's taking more amps. It pushes through that, then it charges the spring, and then it drops down. And you can see that for A, B, and C phase. And this gives you good insight. Again, these are all results you need to trend. You look at it compared to the last one, and that's why with our, tech, our circuit breaker testing equipment, all that is kept in store for you to verify. So now let's look at some tests since we were talking about call current analysis. You also have your minimum operating voltage test. This basically verifies that the breaker operates at a minimum voltage for it to, for it to be called upon. So for example, for the closed operation, uh, if you have 85% of rated operating voltage AC or DC, you expect that call to still pick up and close. So if it's 125 volt DC, I believe 85% uh, of that is about 106, uh, 106 volts. So at 106 volts, you expect the uh, call to uh, pick up and 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 operate. Well, what if it opens at uh, 80 volt? Does he like? Is it bad? That's even better. The lower, the better. That means your call is still engaging with a low DC voltage. And this, and the reason behind this is you can have your battery bank being drained, but when called upon, you want to make sure that the call can, you know. Uh, what's the minimum voltage I need, the minimum juice I need so the call can operate? Uh, so that's why, and for open, it's 70% of your rated operating voltage uh, uh, for DC and 85% for AC. And that is basically your minimum operating voltage test. And this can also give insight to your coil. If you do this once in a while and you see like, well, uh, the minimum, let's say you tested the, the bare minimum and for you it was at a 65%. You're happy. Well, I'm, I need 65% of my battery voltage to work. I'm happy. You know, next time you tested it, it was 75%. You're still happy because you lowered the 85%. But you and I clearly know, like, well, that's a 10% jump. Maybe something is getting bad. Maybe the call, perhaps the call is getting weaker. And then if you tie that with your call current analysis and overlay the graph, you start to paint the whole picture to see how the whole thing operates. Uh, and next, you have your first trip test. Uh, this is basically uh, a good test because most times your breaker has not operated in a long time. It's just sitting there in the conducting phase and you don't know what's wrong as far as this can reveal. This test helps reveal lubrication issues and it's a quick diagnos diagnostic screening method before you operate the breaker. Uh, it's, ve it's very, very uh, highly recommended uh, because you can get the as found state of a circuit breaker. So as the name says, first trip, you're basically capturing results before the breaker is actually tripped. And because after it trips, you're going to perform many closed open operation and that can wash off stuff. And so you really don't know. So first trip gives us a very good insight to how a breaker is operating. Uh, so here's the connection hookup for a first trip test. Basically, we're going to the uh, uh, control circuits that we talked about in the beginning. Nothing too fancy here. I have my trip coil. I have my closed coil. I have a bunch of permissives. I have my A and B contact my 52A and my 52B contact. So what I'm doing here is I'm just wiring into those contacts with my uh, my device. I'm also timing my auxiliary contacts, and then I'm putting a clamp over the supply voltage, a current clamp, to basically sense the current. I'm also putting 
uh, uh, inputs from the voltage to measure the voltage in the system. And with this test, I can see how quickly, this is the first operation, so I'm not connected to the stabs of the breaker, I'm just connected to the uh, control unit. Once the breaker is then trips, in this case when it opens, I can see how quickly the auxiliary contact opened. I can look at the signature of the current and the voltage, and, that, and also the call current analysis. That can now give me insight of how the breaker actually functions, the as found uh, uh, state of the breaker. So once the breaker is done, the breaking state, the last part of it is the isolating state where the breaker is fully opened. Uh, typically, we're looking at the uh, insulation at in this case for the breaker. Uh, insulation resistance is a very, very basic test that you always do for almost every electrical apparatus out there. Uh, for a circuit breaker, it's a one minute test. You're basically checking across the poles of each phase. And uh, depending on the voltage rate, equipment rating voltage of the circuit breaker, uh, the, uh, so if it's uh, in our case, if it's a uh, 34, five uh, 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 KV breaker, uh, test voltage will be uh, uh, 15 KDC. Uh, so basically we're doing a phase to phase with the circuit breaker opening, we're doing an across poles of each phase. With the circuit breaker closed, we're doing a phase to phase and a phase to ground. Uh, over here in the graph, you see basically a, a mega S1 installation resistant test kit, basically doing installation resistance across a circuit breaker. And this, you know, you have a table that you go by, it's also trended results uh, because a very high uh, mega or giga ohm reading can be going low over time, but you've not reached the bad threshold, but you, so you is always good to trend results. And this is all temperature dependent, so you also have to correct because you could be testing a breaker in Alaska versus a breaker in Texas. Um, next would be power factor. Uh, power factor is a good test outside to verified insulation. You can also have moisture contamination resulting from leaks, uh, incomplete clean and drying on the bushings. Uh, if the breaker has grading capacitors, this could be, uh, you could see deterioration in the line to ground and contact grading capacitors. Uh, you can also uh, uh, see deterioration in the uh, uh, insulating components, such as your operating rod, your interrupters, and the supports. Uh, so analyzing power factor on a breaker, it's not like a transformer where the power factor is calculated. What you're really looking at here is we're evaluating the result based on the current and dielectric losses. So we're applying a high voltage and then we're measuring the leakage current. Uh, if that leakage current and we're trending that, if, if that's high, that means you have higher watt losses. Uh, for every uh, for every watt loss you have, you're not being efficient. And then you're comparing this results based off that and to the nameplate data. Uh, so for uh, different types of circuit breakers, uh, there are different uh, 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 power factor methods. Uh, so just looking at a medium voltage circuit breaker, you're going to perform nine tests. Test one to six would be your GST called your grounded specimen test where you're measuring the pole to ground. Uh, and then from test seven to nine will be your measurement from pole to pole. And in the picture here, uh, uh, in the picture here, you can see if the breaker has uh, arc shoots, uh, it shows you how to connect uh, in a picture. So in this case, this is a, in this case right here, I'm just my pointer. All my pointers here. Yeah, so this tells you how to connect. So you have your uh, high voltage lead going to one side, and then you have your low voltage and you're guarding that out and you're measuring the current. Uh, and the oil circuit breaker, you also have uh, basically nine tests. Test one to six is basically testing the insulation of one bushing, the interrupter, the, the lift, the lift rods, the tank liner. Uh, so basically you're applying a high voltage to one bushing and you're measuring the leakage to ground. And you do that for all bushings. So that's your test one to six. And the breaker is in the open state when you do this. Test seven to nine, the breaker is in the closed state. So you're basically doing your uh, insulation test across both bushings. Uh, and then SF6 breaker, a uh, similar, similar hookup with a OCB, you're basically doing a test one to six, which is a, with the breakers open is a GST, you're evaluating the condition of your bushings. And from test seven to nine, you're looking at the overall watt losses in the breaker, which is a UST measurement. Uh, you're basically applying uh, voltage, uh, 10 kV, uh, and then you're measuring the overall current losses, or overall current leakage, which gives you your watt loss. And this is very meaningful for breakers that have grading capacitors with SF6 breakers because you're basically looking at the leakages on those capacitors, which is which are insulations. Um, so yeah, so now let's look at what Megger offers as far as uh, circuit breaker testing goes. Uh, we have the TM1800. Uh, this is the, the top of the line 
uh, bad boy on steroid. It can do dual ground. So once you hang two grounds, it can do the timing. It can do uh, DRM, static and dynamic resistance measurements. And it can go up to 16 bricks per phase breaker. And this has configurable slots where you can configure uh, all kinds of, whether it's an IPO breaker, you can take out and remove slots to maybe do more uh, current analysis measurements or more timing measurements or more motion measurements if you have IPOs. The TM1700, just like the TM1800, only difference is you don't have the uh, ability to um, configure slots. Uh, and you can see the TM1800 has a keyboard, the TM, but they're both touch screens. The TM1700 has touch screens. They can both do, both do dual ground uh, and also uh, uh, dynamic capacitance measurements, basically timing with dual grounds connected. Uh, and the other side, we have uh, uh, the Eagle, which is our newest product. Uh, Compared to the TM, the Eagle is state-of-the-art, very, very powerful, and extremely easy to use. A lot of people are scared of breaker testing because of the leads, the connections, but the uh, Eagle brings it, it makes it, it's like, it's just like making a phone call on your phone. It's very easy to use. You're connecting, and you're controlling, and you're capturing your results, and you're done. The Eagle can also do dual ground and dynamic resistance and capacity measurements. Uh, there's an asterisk there. This is additional features that is yet to be released, uh, but it soon, will soon to be released. So, And the Eagle for mid-range testers, where it basically fits in between the line from having a very, very high unit like the TM. You want, we wanted something mid-range that could perform a good job, easy to use, and will knock the job out quickly. And then in the very, very low range, we have the regular Eagle. Uh, this is one break for phase. You can just do auxiliary timing, and you can do motion measurements. Uh, this is just the low range end of testing, suitable for someone who's just doing timing on, say, uh, a medium voltage circuit breaker. And yeah, not so much configurability there, yes. So this is what Mega offers as far as circuit breaker testing. Uh, and this would then conclude the end of my presentation. So now I'm going to hand over to the... Uh, uh, presenting guys, yeah, marketing guys. All righty. Thank you so much, Dozy. We thank you. definitely appreciate it. Um, at this time... I apologize for my kid jumping in here and there, but uh, <laughs> being a mom today and a dad, yeah, but <laughs> doing both. Yeah. No worries. We all understand. Mm -hmm. um, at this time, the presentation portion of the webinar is officially concluded. We'll now take some time to answer as many of your questions as possible. If you have any questions, please feel free to submit them into the Ask a Question window. For those of you that are leaving, please be sure to fill out the survey before you head out. We would greatly appreciate if you could take a couple minutes to provide some feedback so that we can continue to improve on our future webinars. And also on the survey, there is a field where you can request a demo or a quote for any of the maker products if interested. A copy of the presentation, certificate of attendance, and a link to the video recording of this webinar will be emailed to everybody in about two business days. The link that you use to join this session will bring you to a recording of the webinar in about an hour after we wrap up here. You can also view video recordings of previous webinars, as well as register for upcoming webinars at our website at us.maker.com webinars. Be sure to join us on March 29th for the first edition of our MGA webinar series, Episode 1, Proactive Vegetation Management, presented by David Schlain. Also, our next NEDA certified webinar will be on April 21st, titled Battery Testing According to NERC, PRC 5 and 6, presented by David Martinez. All right, now let's get to your questions. So, looks like question one here is for Volney. And they ask, in the closing and opening charts, the dashes on the thick lines, is that just a recording error or were those bouncing off contacts? A uh, very good catch there. Uh, it is actually a bouncing contact. So um, that means that the uh, probably the fingers of the fixed contact there are loose, or the uh, it, it, by nature the breaker uh, because the moving contact is is reaching there at a very fast speed. It will make those fingers to open a little bit, and they will create a little bit of uh, opening of the of the electrical circuit. But in reality, the the first contact was made, and and the breaker can be declared closed at that point. So, uh, also uh, sometimes if you connect the leads in the wrong spot, you could be connecting to a loose point. So you could have that uh, as as a bouncing contact or, or bouncing uh, there. But it it 
it's just a matter of verifying that you are connected in the right spot. Uh, that's common to see also in medium voltage breakers, rack in, rack out breakers, that uh, the, the fingers are, are kind of a, they move a little bit. You can also see that there if you connect to those to those fingers. So uh, it's a matter of uh, looking at the result and uh, verifying that you are connected correctly. If uh, everything's good with the connection, it's definitely some bouncing that it's inside the, the breaker. That is normal. Uh, but if it is excessive, then you should take care, probably uh, do a little bit more of investigation. Thank you so much. Um, it looks like we have another question for you. They ask, um, earlier in the presentation, there was a breaker with a bad dash pot. Was it an IPO breaker? Yes. Yes. That was a, a, a breaker with actually two breaks per phase IPO breaker. Correct. Awesome. What can we do if the breaker is slower than expected on the trips, opens, and closes? And this one is for Joseph. All right, so uh, if the breaker is, I'll just start with the uh, the closes first. So if the uh, breaker is pretty slow on the closes, uh, kind of depends on the breaker because some of these you, it might be uh, pneumatic, so just air could be hydraulic or hydraulic, so a combination of air and hydraulic fluid or just hydraulic fluid. So first of all, you have to make sure that there's enough pressure to actually go into uh, closing the mechanism. So if that's all good, it could just be a gummy uh, mechanism as well, right? So uh, lubrication and uh, don't use WD-40 since it's a water displacement. Uh, so basically it'll just start seeping into the bearings and then pushing out the grease that you actually have in there, making it slow over time. So when you're actually testing at that moment, it does make it faster. But when it's called upon to actually do a trip later on, which I'm about to talk to in a second, uh, that could make it slower. Um, in the future so also on the actual trips itself the the best thing to do is just operate the breaker right so um as i said before most of the time it's just stagnant uh some of these especially radio fed lines they don't trip often right because they might be a lock-on position instead of lock out or things like this so uh to actually exercise the breaker uh three or four or five times you know full cycle so trips and closes and then start your measurements over again so those are some of the best ways to actually uh, make your breaker faster or to uh, get better test results. But however, that's why you want to be sure to get your first trip because I actually want to show you the true state of the breaker at that moment in time. Awesome. Thank you so much, Joseph. Uh, we've got a short question here for Dozy. They ask, what is 63X? Uh, 63X is a sudden pressure permissive. So it's basically your sudden pressure relay. Uh, so in this case, if you have a breaker with say SF6 and you don't have, uh, you have a low pressure, that's, that would not give you, uh, uh, that would not satisfy your permissive for you to say, uh, uh, to basically create a permissive where you can operate the breaker. So that has to be satisfied. So in this case, that was a, in that, I think it was a control diagram. 63X would be the sudden pressure relay. And those are one of those permissives that needs to be satisfied for the trip call or the, uh, uh, for the trip call to our performance duties. Awesome. Thank you so much. So it's an anti number. It's basically 63 is the anti number for a pressure switch. And yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, we've got a question going back to Volney here. Um, it asks, is there any difference in the results when testing with conventional methods versus dual ground methods? Uh, actually, no. Uh, the the, met, the dual ground mm -hmm. method is very very accurate, and it it it's based in the in the end is based out of detecting a, a current change. The conventional method detects a zero current when the breaker is open, and it detects a current when it is. Uh, when it closes, as soon as it closes, the DRM method, sorry, the DCM method, the, the dual ground method detects uh, a low current when the breaker is closed and it detects a high current when the breaker closes. So it's detecting a change of current, which is very clear. Uh, another way to do the dual ground method is with dynamic resistance measurement. And uh, when you do dynamic resistance measurement for uh, the uh, dual ground method, 
detecting the change of resistance uh, from uh, zero or from the, the ground loop down to the uh, arcing contact and then very fast to the uh, main contact. Uh, it's, it's a very uh, rapid change uh, on very small uh, values of resistance and it's very difficult to detect. So uh, it, it's more accurate to do it with dual, uh, dual, the dual ground with the DCM, which is what Dozy explained. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, we have a question for Joseph. It asks, is it okay if the breaker operates much faster than expected? That is a uh, trick question. So uh, yes and no. So uh, the reason yes, because you might have a time for, let's say, uh, three cycles or something on there. And so to get that milliseconds, you multiply that by 16.6, get you about, what is that, about 48 so if you have a trip time a lot faster than that, that's good. However, if it does become too fast, you could have uh, boundaries for a restrike. So what that means is as actual uh, contacts break apart, and if they're too fast, it's just going to draw the arc, and it's still going to be connected right there and still be in service, right? Until mm -hmm. finally the SF6 could smother it out, or if there's not enough in SF6 or a... Uh, oil breaker, not typically an oil breaker, you see this, but mostly SF6, that arc will still be in there, right? Until you open up the switches to de-energize it the rest of the way. So um, operating it too fast could be a bad thing for a restrike, but other than that, you know, uh, operating it, you know, pretty fast is a good thing. Perfect, thank you so much. We're going back to Dozy for this next question. It asks, in the contact resistant measurement, it was mentioned never to exceed nominal current. Why is that? Uh, because you don't want to exceed the rating of the breaker. Um, that's why, uh, so typically the IEEE standard is at 100 amps uh, of DC. So when you're testing, you wouldn't want to test, uh, say the breaker was uh, in service for, uh, let's say conducting, it, con it conducts, you're in a number out here, I'd say uh, 300 amps. Uh, you wouldn't want to test with a DC voltage of, say, 400 amps. Uh, so most test instruments standardize for uh, breaker testing VOS 400 amps. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. um, next question is for Volney. They ask, can you give an example of dynamic resistance results with bad contacts slash extinguishing medium? There are some opinions against dynamic resistance tests. Okay, so I don't know if I can change the slide here, but if you can, okay, yeah, I can see. So, uh, well, we were not prepared to, to show a full example here, but um, we have definitely other webinars that show comparison of, of these results. But just to give a, a brief explanation here, uh, this zone here is the length of the arcing contact and uh, the... Uh, I don't know if I can show my pointer. Let me see. Uh, okay. So this zone here is the uh, the arcing contact, and what it is the intention of the dual of the dynamic resistance measurement is is to get a fingerprint if you don't have the actual length of the arcing contact, get a fingerprint, and then when you test in the future and the breaker has gone through some. Uh, uh, openings under under fault then this length or this uh, uh time here is going to be reduced so you're going to have this uh peak uh showing here uh it's going to be uh kind of closer to the to the previous peak which is when the when the arcing contact the main contact part so uh it's about comparison or determining the actual length from the graph um and and these uh, slides that we have uh, previously uh, in the in the presentation is an actual example of, of that that you can do that. Uh, I don't 
I probably I would need more reference or more information about why it is not recommended. Uh, but it's it's a test that you can do on uh, SF6 breakers or any breaker that has arc in contact. Um, and it's not I don't see why it will not be recommended. Uh, there, you are not exceeding the the current the nominal current of the breaker, uh, which it's not that it's going to harm it. It's just basically not going to get an accurate value for a resistance. Dynamic resistance measurement doesn't care about the actual value. It's just more about the the shape of the curve or the the, the graph. So, uh, yeah, probably if, if if you have more details about why it won't be recommended, we can uh, uh, answer in more detail um, in privately. Perfect. Thank you so much. Our next question is for Dozy. They ask, if the charging motor has, for example, 360 watts, how big can the current be at the end of the charging period? They say that they need this value when selecting cables for DC power supply. Uh, so typically, at the end of the charging period, when you're talking about your full load amps, that current is given to you on your motor nameplate. Um, so, and the way to calculate this uh, for basically it's, for if it's a DC motor, if you know the wattage, and you know the voltage, you're basically doing uh, uh, you're doing a power calculation with a voltage calculation to get your amps. And that's typically, uh, for DC, you don't have to use any square root of three. Uh, so you have V times I is equal to P. So if you know your which is your power, your voltage times your current. So if I know my power uh, and I know my voltage, that's the voltage at the terminal, I know the power of the motor. If I divide that, I should get my steady state current. And so once you now know that current, and you go to your conductor sizing catalog and you compare and basically you size your cable appropriately. Uh, typically you're going, uh, that's your uh, full load current, you're going 1.25 larger. So in this case, let's say the current was suitable for a uh, 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 two odd cable or that's probably big, let's say uh, eight gauge or something like that. Then you select that based on your current, your conductor sizing chart. Uh, given the material of the conductor, the temperature and the application and all that. But typically that's how you size it up. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, going back to Joseph for this next question, they ask, could these tests for circuit breakers be done on circuit switches too? Yes. So uh, a circuit switcher is pretty much a, uh, a circuit breaker, right? There's uh, small differences in between the two. A circuit breaker is uh, made to interrupt the load, right? And a circuit switcher is a non-sacrificial piece, which typically trips about 80% of its rating. So um, you can still do like a DLRO or a mega ohm meter test, right? So basically just apply a, uh, a current and read the millivolt drop giving your, your resistance or contact resistance test. And you can also still do the timing test on those. Um, and it also kind of depends on the type of circuit switcher that you have because you might just have an interrupter style or interrupter and a switch. And so uh, it depends on where you're going to make these measurements at as far as your contact resistance. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, our next question is going back to Volney. They ask, for a live tank breaker, is it important if we connect line side on top or on the bottom of the interrupting chamber? Okay, so... Uh, to give a little bit of context to to the audience, uh, as Dozy explained at the beginning, uh, breakers need to be grounded on both ends uh, prior to doing the connections, and then uh, one of the sides needs to be ungrounded to be able to conduct the test under the conventional method. These, uh, this is because, well, uh, conventional method does the test with a uh, continuity test. And uh, if you have the ground loop, you will never be able to detect the breaker opening. Uh, so the, uh, the question relates to which sa side should be uh, ungrounded uh, for the test or which side would be grounded once you need to, to remove one of the grounds. Uh, the idea is to unground or have the, the side that is going to be ungrounded uh, uh, 
the, that side uh, the one is the one that you want to unground the side that is far uh, far apart from the noise source from the induction noise and uh, that depends on the, the how the substation is built and how the the connections are are done there in the overhead lines in uh, some cases it's not easy so that's why the dual ground method is it's uh, recommended and much better to use because that way you don't need to unground you always keep the safety uh, if you get induction through the instrument and uh, something happens with the grounds uh, you can get currents of up to i don't know 10 milliamps uh, which is a lot of current being pushed by by such a high voltage so uh, it's it's a good question in relation of uh, thinking about the safety and always trying to unground the side that is uh, the mm, the farthest from the from the induction. Thank you so much. Um, it looks like our last question is for you again, Volney, unless we get another question here in a few seconds. They ask, if you have a vacuum breaker that passes the high pot test but failed the Mager insulation test on the open test, would this still be a fail test? Okay, so since it is in the open position uh, means that the Great. high pot um, is being used to test the vacuum bottle. And uh, the insulation test, um, it could be also uh, used for the, well, it's probably not much that you are doing there with the, when the, when the open position, but uh, uh, it's typical to run both tests. And the insulation test is done also, not, not only to verify the bottle, but also to verify insulation to, uh, from the, each side of the breaker to ground. So, uh, first of all, um, the, uh, the high pot test is probably not the best uh, test to perform on a vacuum circuit breaker because it generates X-rays. Um, and there's some dedicated equipment to do that verification. You can minimize the X-rays by uh, injecting or using a, an instrument that applies very clean DC signal. And um, also, uh, well, you should care not to exceed the voltages that you should use for the testing. So uh, that that way you can uh, probably get away from the high pot. And uh, the, uh, if you get a failing test or a failing result with the insulation resistance means that probably you don't have a problem with the bottle it per, uh, per se, but you have a problem uh, on each side of the a breaker or the conductors on each side, the incoming and the outgoing, uh, to ground. Something might be uh, uh, introducing uh, a problem there with the with the linkage or the any part of the insulation associated to these two conductors that uh, come in, come and go out of the breaker. So it will be something to to uh, investigate further. Awesome. Thank you so much. <clears throat> well, it looks like we're out of questions for today. Um, if anybody in the audience thinks of anything else, please feel free to contact us offline and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Um, as a reminder, a copy of the presentation, certificate of attendance, and a link to the video recording of this webinar will be emailed to everybody in about two business days. Um, thank you all for attending today. After we conclude here, please remember to answer our survey. That survey will include a field for you to request a quote or demo if you're interested and a field to let us know how we did and what topics we should cover in the future. Once again, I'd like to thank you all for attending and have a great weekend. Thank you.